Dr. Alex. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Alex uh, Chinek uh, with us. Um, as you said, he works with uh, art, architecture, and engineering. And I think uh, what is fascinating, uh, what you will see this evening, is that he reacts to different places. Uh, it's a con uh, contextually response uh, of sculptural interventions. He looks at things, he starts coming up with concepts, and he comes with very interesting uh, uh, interventions. And I think interventions is an important uh, word. Um, he will talk about 7,500 wax bricks. He will talk about um, what it is to be the youngest member of the board of the Royal British uh, Society of Sculptures. Um, I give the floor to Alex. Give him a big applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three introductions. One artist. <laughs> Sounds like a film. Um, thank you very much for having me, and thank you to the university, and thank you to uh, Somu and Gunjun for everything they've done for me while I've been here, and Trees and the AQ program. Um, so, as those introductions kind of touched upon, um, I'm based in the UK, my studio is based in London, and I am an artist, I'm principally a sculptor, but I'm interested in lots of different disciplines, and those include art, of course, but also architecture, engineering, construction, and industry. And I'm interested in the materials, the processes, the people, and the possibilities of each of those fields. Um, I'll start by talking about this project, because this quite neatly summarizes what we do and why we do it. This is a project that we created about three years ago. It's called Telling the Truth Through False Teeth. And we took a dilapidated, empty, unused building in the middle of Hackney, which, is a, a, which was a slightly deprived area in London. And we removed every single pane of glass from its, window, from its windows. And what we did was, when we were removing them, they were all smashed. And we scanned the smashes. And we built up this digital, digital archive of each of the smashes. And then we chose one of them. And we reproduced it 312 times using 1,248 pieces of glass. So what we did was we created this huge architectural illusion. Now, this was the product of studies that we'd been creating previously in my studio. For a long time, I'd been exploring the materials and the processes of architecture, but producing smaller scale artworks for a gallery context. But increasingly, I felt like the work and the language that it spoke didn't fit or didn't belong within a gallery environment. I was only making art for gallery because I was an artist, and I thought that was what I was supposed to do. But I suddenly realized that when making projects of this nature, it would be far more exciting and impressive if they were reintroduced back into an architectural environment. And I kind of, in doing that and in that realization, stumbled upon this idea of public art where you could create large-scale, public-run projects that absolutely anyone could go and see and enjoy and hopefully understand. And the last word was critical, this idea of understanding art. Because in the public realm, there's absolutely no room for intellectual elitism. And so it's critical that it offers this kind of accessibility. And the way that we deliver accessibility is with simple pleasures, and simple pleasures like illusion, and spectacle, and size, and humor, and warmth. And we walk this very fine line between playfulness and silliness and serious sculptural intent. And we balance that by making very, very complex sculptural and structural objects and situations and feats fused with these kind of playful, accessible, endearing, and engaging qualities. This was a project that we produced after the identically smashed windows. It's called From the Knees of My Nose to the Belly of My Toes. And this, we took a property in South England in an area called Margate. Now, this was a coastal town. And a lot of the coastal towns in England have suffered terribly in the last 10, 20 years because the tourism that used to visit there has gone, purely because people are now traveling abroad when they go on holiday. So what you have is these areas that were once very, very grand and very, very affluent. And the architecture reflects that. But in the last 20 years, they've become very poor and very real struggling areas. So the architecture is very tired and dilapidated. Now, Margate is a really, really interesting UK case study. Because what they did there was 
they built a very large art gallery. Now, where they used to rely on the beaches and the fun fairs and the kind of seaside activities to draw in trade and footfall and tourism, they started to turn to culture. And I love the idea that culture and creativity can be used as a powerful tool for regeneration and in creating employment and creating tourism and trade and all of the positive things that people rarely associate with art. And so it became this powerful tool. So I was excited by, to deliver a project there and a public realm project such as this. Now this was a considerable undertaking. I produced this work about three years ago and this at the time I had absolutely no money and we had, all I had was the idea. Now what I'd been doing up to this point was I'd been teaming up with companies across British industry. So one thing that I learned very early on in my practice was that there, there's far more artists than there are opportunities. So as a young artist you have to create your own opportunities for your own practice and your career to flourish and emerge. So I started forging relationships with lots and lots of companies, industries, manufacturers, craftsmen across British industry and forging this relationship where I would come to them with a creative idea or concept and in return they would lend me their experience or their materials or their resources. And I teamed up with the largest brick manufacturer in the UK, a company called Ibstock Brick. They represent about 65% of the UK brick market. And we started making all of these different material studies and small sculptural studies for about a year. And they financed the whole project. And these weren't very large and we would show these actually in a gallery environment. Now, one of those projects that we created was just this small study of a sliding wall. It had no architectural features, it was just a sculptural form. And then we did an illustration, which was this, where we would create the illusion that the entire facade of a property was sliding into the front garden. Now, as I say, we had absolutely no money and we had no property to do it. So I spent six months traveling around the UK, meeting companies, and I convinced every single company who would be required for the project, including structural engineers, carpenters, steel workers, bricklayers, brick manufacturers, um, to donate all of the materials for free. Then we had to find the house, and I wanted to do it in Margate for these reasons mentioned previously, that the idea that sculpture and art could be used as a way of creating positive generation. And so, <coughs> I went to Margate and I met their council and we had lots and lots of meetings and eventually they agreed to give their houses that they owned. It was an old house, it hadn't been occupied for 11 years, it was fire damaged and water damaged so it was a real eyesore. So creating or introducing an artwork there could only be a positive thing. So we collectively through the donations of the materials and the property and all of the labour we delivered the entire project for free. And it would have cost in the UK a considerable amount of money, about £100,000. Now, very rarely at that time were people commissioning public artworks of that much money. Also, for an artist who had only created one piece, which was the identically smashed windows, they would never, ever release that kind of money. So, as I say, there's far more artists there and there are opportunities. So, I said about kind of almost commissioning myself. So the day after we finished this project, we had to go back to London to start another project. And when we finished this, I didn't really know what would happen. I just wanted to finish it. I mean, just realizing it was the excitement and was the objective. And getting to the finish line, I was amazed we actually did it. And then I returned to London the next day to start another project. But then I got a phone call saying, you have to come back to Margate. And I went back to Margate and the entire street was just full of news crews and cameramen and reporters and it was the reach was extraordinary it went all over the world it was shared by millions and millions of people and then I started to realize the value of not only creating public art in the public realm but how if you put it into a public space the public then take it on as their own and begin to share it and I create artwork to be seen and enjoyed and the idea that it has that global reach where millions and millions of people potentially see, understand and enjoy it gives me incredible pleasure. So the next day, as I say, we returned to London and we delivered this project. This took about four months and what we did was we took an existing, again dilapidated building and took the architectural silhouette and created the illusion that two buildings had been turned upside down. Now, 
This is a very, very large sculpture, one of the largest sculptures in London. But I have this philosophy that public art shouldn't scream for attention and that you should find it before it finds you. And so when producing a piece of art this large in an area as busy as it was, I like this idea of creating artwork which is contextually responsive. And so you tune the visual and material decisions and language of the artwork to the surrounding environment. And that way, it doesn't dominate the environment. It simply harmonizes and hopefully elevates it in a kind of beautiful, interesting, theatrical, playful, simple way. Whatever job it's trying to do, it doesn't do it in such an obtrusive fashion. And that's very, very important in public art. The nicest thing about this project, and not many artists say this, is that most people don't even know it's there. <laughs> they walk past it and don't see it. But I think that's important, that art has the ability to disappear. And all of my work, and I think increasingly I'm losing this ability. I think the, the commissioners or the media pressure that my practice finds itself under at times Increasingly, I find myself under this pressure to deliver a spectacle, something that everyone will go to and be astounded by and be wowed by. But I think, the, or in many ways, I shouldn't say this, I should say this at the end of the lecture, because in many ways, I think the most successful piece in, in terms of the ability to balance spectacle and subtlety was the identically smashed windows, because it was on a building, all we were doing were reintroducing broken windows. We removed broken windows and put them back in. We just slightly poetically and theatrically elevated or twisted them. And that's what my sculptures do. It's a reimagination of the physical world around us or a representation of the physical world around us. And that's what sculpture is. And so what I do and what my studio does is just take the built environment and the architectural environment that surrounds us. Because it's about, and that's why I suppose the title of the lecture is this, it's about elevating the everyday world. So I think there's something very optimistic, accessible, and pleasurable about taking the objects and the structures and the materials that surround us every single day and doing something slightly different with them. After the Upside Down Buildings, we were commissioned to create a piece for Covent Garden Piazza. So if you've been to London, you've probably been to Covent Garden Piazza. Uh, it's arguably our busiest square, and it's a very kind of beautiful and um, architecturally um, iconic uh, place. Now, it was a very difficult commission. We were asked to create something of the kind of size and impact that we'd been previously creating, but it had to be temporary. Now, I'll talk about temporary art in a minute and why I think it's wonderful, but it had to be temporary. It had to be kind of impressive and large. Large and impressive don't necessarily go hand in hand, but Covent Garden is a very fast-paced area. I used to think it was fast-paced until I visited India. Um, it's actually quite slow and boring now. But um, at the time, I thought it was hectic. Um, but <clears throat> it is a fast pace and it's a recreational area. So it's typically a place where Londoners go maybe once a month and tourists may go once a year or maybe once a lifetime. And so it's very busy and everyone's moving around and there's a lot of activity there. It's a very theatrical place. You have a lot of magicians, a lot of performers, etc. And so everybody's kind of fighting for a piece of you know, the pie. And so what we wanted to do was create something kind of physically astounding and impressive. So size in this instance was important. Now, there was lots of decisions to be made, and we, this is when we started to become more aligned, even though we're not architects, by no means we're artists, but we became more aligned with an architecture practice in the way we go about our activities. Because to create something on Covent Garden Piazza of size for one month, it's a very tricky political situation. And you do need planning consent, and you do need building regulations, and you do need to go through all of the regulatory administrational processes that a building might. So we knew if we were going to do this, we had to design something that was even more than anything we'd made before, perfectly harmonious, visually, materially, historically, with the context and the surrounding architecture, because that's exactly what everyone's trying to protect and celebrate. 
And that also worked in terms of the way we make illusions, because I think illusions hinge on this idea of believability. So if you can create something which is a mirror image or an absolute reflection of the surrounding environment, it heightens the impact and the believability of the artwork. So what we did was, this was on the east side of Covent Garden Piazza. We cr created a one-to-one -one replica of a building on the west side of the piazza, and then remodeled it and constructed it on the east. Now, what we did was, as you can see, hopefully, we created the illusion that the upper half of the building was absolutely floating in the air. And in terms of the building, there was absolutely no point of contact, and the public were free to walk beneath it. Now, the upper structure still weighed five tons, and we had over one and a half billion people walk underneath this in the month. So it was quite a nerve-wracking time, and I really had to trust my structural engineers during this period. So the bottom half, what we did was <clears throat> we commissioned a digital topographic survey, a very detailed one. So we understood a very good, to a very good level of detail, the cobbled terrain. And so we could cut and carve the base, the plinth of the building to the terrain. So it had this kind of seamlessness. The columns at the base, they were cast into the cobbles on site. So they were absolutely blended in and they were extremely heavy. The upper section of the building was CNC carved, or five axes machine carved, from a material called fill core. Now, fill core is what's typically used to pack out cement when you're pouring foundations. We, it's a form of polystyrene, but I don't know the word, I don't know if that's a word that's used here, but it's a form of lightweight, it's a lightweight modeling material. And then that was rendered in a material called jesmonite, which is a very thin but stone like gel coating and then we scenic treated it. But so much detail and so much time went into the, uh, the design and the development and the study and the making of the artwork, T tangibly to touch and to see and to feel and to walk around. It was absolutely identical to the surrounding architecture. Now, <clears throat> one of the conditions of the planning was the central avenue that goes through Covent Garden Piazza, which is this here. One of the conditions of planning was that when walking from the east to the west, west to the east, you couldn't see the artwork, so that the sight line through the tunnel was visually interrupted. And so that's how we set our hovering height, so that when walking through that, you didn't see the artwork. Now, what we try to do is hide the engineering into the context. So it's not just about responding visually, materially, or historically to the surroundings. But it's about making where the structural engineering is required, we make it try and disappear. And that's much to the disappointment of my wonderful structural engineers, but that's all part of the illusion. So on the right-hand side is the market stool. Now, these market stools are dotted, all, you see them in the background. They're, they're dotted all around Covent Garden Piazza. So what we did was we took one of those and we used that to conceal our counterweight. So inside the market stool is 15 tons of steel. We weren't allowed to obviously create any foundations, so it was a considerable challenge. Now, during this period, this is a very, very busy square. We shut Covent Garden Piazza on that side for three days. We had two cranes operating. We had two forklifts, about three cherry pickers. The whole project, we worked with over 100 different people, but on site, we had about 25 people. It was the most stressful three days of my life. We worked day and night. We had 10 Arctic trucks come in and out. Um, and the Disney store threatened to sue me uh, during the process, um, <coughs> which was stressful. But it was a hit. <coughs> so, <coughs> as I say, it was seen by over 1.5 million people. And this was commissioned by the landowners, or they have a 1,000-year lease. So they're essentially the landowners. And increasingly, my studio is approached and this is a model that's slowly developing in the UK, um, and it's a very difficult model for artists to respond to, because it's not just about art, it's about design and engineering, and as I say, it becomes almost more thinking, a lot more, more akin with an architecture practice. But this was commissioned by a developer in the UK, or a landowner in the UK, and their objective is to increase f footfall but also to generate media attention. And the two go hand in hand. And if they can create media attention through cultural value and cultural investment and create footfall, that creates trade and you know, it's a win-win. So it's a fantastic relationship because artists and culture and the people who enjoy seeing art 
and watching culture benefit, but also the investors and the commissioners, they also get something from that. And that's, if that relationship wasn't a win-win, it wouldn't exist. And, but it continues to grow, and it's a wonderful model in London. That, that, that just gets better and better and it's spreading across the country. So this was on the national news in 35 different countries. So it had an enormous global reach and it was on in the, it was reported in the 10 most read. So at the same time we produced that project, we produced this project. So we produced these two projects in two weeks and in the same two weeks I had my first child, well my only child. Uh, so it was, a, it, was, um, it, was, it was a busy time, a busy fortnight. Um, <coughs> so where Covent Garden was this fast-paced uh, recreational area of theatricality and magic tricks, etc., um, where we kind of had to deliver an artwork that was kind of, in some ways, it sounds horrible from an artistic perspective, but it's a contemporary reality conceived for an Instagram culture where people would photograph it and share it. We were producing this commission not too far away, but in a very, very different environment. Now, this is near a train station called London Bridge, which is a very, very busy train station. And it's, we were very near that. And it's on a commuter path, so thousands and thousands of people would walk past this plot of land every day. So I like the idea that we would create an artwork that would be there for about a month, month and a half, we didn't know, um, maybe two months, hopefully not more than two months, we were hoping at the time. But an artwork that because thousands of people would be going past it every single day, it could change. And you would tell a story. Because it's very rare. With Covent Garden, someone would go and see it, and that's it. They've seen it once, and they don't go back to that area. But because the same thousands of people are walking past it every morning, every night, it would be nice to tell them a story that has a beginning, a middle, and end, and create a sculptural transformation. So we designed a house, and we built this house, and we left this house there for a week completely unchanged, so people just became familiar with it. But the house was made from 7,500 wax bricks, and the windows, the white window surrounds were made from wax, the glass in the windows was made from wax, and the door was made from wax. Um, I had a team of people at uh, the largest manufacturer of wax in the UK um, for five months making wax bricks. Uh, they've just forgiven me now for it, and this was about a year ago. And so, as I say, we, we left it there. Now, when building a wax house, you still need to pass UK building regulations. So it still needs to structurally support wind loading and snow loading and ice loading. So we had to design a structure that could embrace that. So we designed a telescopic system that would support the roof. And then it turned out over just over 40 days, we melted the house. And the bricks were absolutely indistinguishable from real bricks. So this was on a, a thing called the BBC One Show. And the BBC One Show is on at 6 p.m. It's the most watched show in the UK. It has about, it's a lot for the UK. It has about seven and a half million viewers. Now, that was really exciting for us because we were slowly, because when, when something's on the One Show, then millions of people come and see it. So the footfall was enormous. And this was really exciting because the artwork, without trying to, it was really starting to enter into the mainstream. And so it really was becoming public art where the public were knowing about it and visiting it and enjoying it and sharing it. And that's critical when delivering things in an open space. After this, we were absolutely broke. <laughs> we completely ran out of money. So. <clears throat> As you can, well, not as you can imagine, but by this stage we were getting a lot of different phone calls from companies um, saying, do things for us, etc. Uh, you know, you, you can do whatever you want. And then they say, but can you make it red? And can you make it look like there's fizzy bubbles coming out of it? And it's, uh, well, you know, and it's slowly they start to shape your, you know, refine your creative freedom. Um, and so, but we were approached by General Motors to do something with one of their car brands, and it was, in the end it was Vauxhall. But they genuinely did say, do what you want, just have to include a car. So I thought, okay, well, that could be quite interesting. And I said, well, how long for? And they said, a week. I said, okay, that's, that's a short lifespan of an artwork because you invest a lot of time and a lot of their money into it. But I like the idea of temporary art. I like the idea of pub permanent public art, but temporary public, temporary 
public art has a completely different license. When delivering something that's temporary, you have much, much greater creative freedom. Your material palette is so much broader, simply because you're not dealing with the issue of durability. Simply, and also, you're allowed to be so much more ambitious. There's absolutely no way we would have been able to create the hovering building that was on Covent Garden Piazza if it was permanent. But because it's temporary, it allows so much more room for creative ambition. Now, don't get me wrong, I love permanent public art, but I think temporary public art has a certain freedom which I very much enjoy. Now, this was a celebration of that idea, as was the melting house, of course. But this became a kind of fun engineering challenge. I wanted to create the illusion that the whole road was peeling up. Now, this is on the south bank, and this has a, this has a very big footfall indeed. But I wanted to create the illusion that the whole road was peeling up, but I wanted it to arrive overnight. So I, what we were having the problem with and what was starting to bother me before was, that was with the melting house, the hovering building, the sliding house, the upside down buildings, we'd be on site. And so there'd never be this kind of moment of reveal or surprise or an interesting moment. So I thought it'd be cool to design something where during the day you could slightly prepare for it and then in the morning, the next day, people would wake up and it would be there. So in the daytime, we dug up the road and that was just roadworks. That didn't look particularly interesting. But what we designed was, yeah. the engineers had designed a structure that was absolutely freestanding with the car attached. And that's what I love about that structure. You can just pick it up and put it anywhere and it freestands. But the foot of it stops about a third of the way compared to the projection. So it was really beautifully engineered. And it was rolled steel. And what we'd done was, previously, we'd taken a cast of the strip that we were peeling up and then we'd cast it onto the curving material. So in terms of surface, it was absolutely identical and it looked exactly like where the road had peeled from. And then with the scenic artist, we created the curling structure. Now, the dimensions was the most interesting and fun thing. We found a trailer in the UK. It's the UK's lowest trailer. Um, and it's 225 millimeters off the ground. So it's, it's about that high off the ground and it goes between the wheels. So the wheels go along, the trailer goes down, and it skims along the floor. So we designed it to sit between the wheels. And then we planned our route, and we measured the lowest bridge on the route from where we were fabricating it to where it was being installed. And we made it five centimeters underneath that. Now, the tricky thing was, you curl the steels, then you add the car, and you add the scenic treatment, and it dips down. So we had to, we, my engineers, had to design the structure so that when it dipped down, it hit the five centimeter underneath the bridge height. And if it was too low, it wouldn't, look, it wouldn't give me the angle that I wanted, and if it was too high, it would hit the bridge. But they got it absolutely perfect. Um, and that was a real car. So we stripped out the engine and all of the weight, and then we designed a system to attach it. Vauxhall were wonderfully fun to work with, but their engineers wanted nothing to do with it. So when we were asking them, how do you attach the car to the road, or will you guarantee this, or will you warrant, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. So we kind of had to inspect the car, test the car, understand it ourselves, and then design a system around it. I, I'm not sure about building regulations or what it's like here, but in the UK, it's very, very difficult to build things. I mean, it, they make it very hard. It's a very strict and regulated process. So it makes it very difficult. All the odds are against you to create projects like this. But interestingly, it's amazing, and I think this is an international thing, where if you approach people who are... I, what we try to do is work with people who put passion before profit. And if you approach companies or individuals or craftsmen who take that philosophy, who are just excited by what they do, they normally want to help you. And it's through collaboration that all of these projects have been realized. I mean, each project now requires many, many, many different people. I mean, I'm responsible for them in terms of design and management and my team, but there's so many different people involved and they wouldn't be possible without them. I actually like it more without the car. That's why I show this shot. So at the end of the week, this was crane lifted away, driven off, road fixed, and then it was done. It was so nice. You know, it was done overnight, gone. It never existed. So 
I'll talk a little bit more about this now. now I focus on this one. This is our, one of our most recent projects. So I want to focus on this idea on, on, on walking through a project and how we respond to a location. This very much was a contextually driven project. After all of these other projects, we were invited by the London Design Festival last year to create the flagship project for them. Um, which is a wonderful invitation. It's rarely given to artists. Uh, it, it's never given to artists. It's typically given to design studios or architects. Um, so I was thrilled, of course. And we were offered lots of different locations, some of them in very, very f iconic and busy areas. But after the chaos of all the previous projects, the last thing I needed was another busy location. And I was excited by the potential of an area called the Greenwich Peninsula. Now, the Greenwich Peninsula is an area on the outskirts of London. And at the moment, it's just completely open land. It's just about to have the biggest redevelopment in the history of London. I mean, I think they're building something like 25,000 flats in one area. But again, it was property developers who were trying to create footfall and develop a story about the area that would generate media attention and hype. And it's a wonderful model. And it really, really works from, a commissioner, from an artist's perspective. So, the Greenwich Peninsula, looking at the history, was the largest oil and gas works in Europe. So it has this wonderful history of power generation and supply. The site that we were looking at, I looked at the neighboring structures, and there was a large old, large old gas tower there that was now redundant. And it has this language of lattice steel. Next to that is the Millennium Dome. You may know that structure. And again, it has this visual language of leaning lattice steel. So you have the leaning steel, and you have the cables coming from it. So combining this history of power generation and this sculptural language of lattice steel, I started thinking about what we call um, electricity pylons. I think they're transmission towers here. But you know what they are, of course. The, you know, the, I, was, I was relieved to see them on your landscape, because then you'd understand what I'm talking about. Um, but. I was interested in this idea of moving away from architecture and moving into also I still we obviously were exploring lots of architectural projects but also civic structures and I liked the idea of applying the philosophy again of taking an everyday object and making it extraordinary and blending this idea of familiarity and fantasy but because the Greenwich Peninsula is a little bit out in the middle of the nowhere I thought it was important to create a very tall structure and a kind of cultural or sculptural beacon and Electricity pylons are a very efficient way of creating a tall structure. Kind of, you know, aligned with what we do, we wanted to create an illusion and use engineering to do it. So we thought it would be interesting to create the illusion that the, an electricity pylon was balancing on its absolute tip, so it had been turned upside down. So we designed a 40 meter electricity pylon. Now it wasn't a standard electricity pylon, it, far from it. When you invert an electricity pylon, you infer all of its structural integrity. So we had to redesign the entire thing. And we used 15 tons of steel and a total length of 1,186 meters of it. And we had to design it so that we used foundations going 25 meters down. And we used 120 tons of concrete hidden underground to balance the structure. So it became, it was an art project, but it became this incredible structural investigation, which we've learned so much from, and we continue to develop projects with that you know, knowledge in mind. But again, it was a very logistically challenging operation. So during the war, the gas works had been bombed a lot, so we had to commission Bombs, unexploded bomb surveys. Now, when I was at art school, I didn't think five years later I'd be commissioning unexploded bomb surveys. But it's, you know, you have to go through this complex path to reach a simple and pleasurable moment, and that's an art practice in, in a nutshell, really. Um, we had to also commission a soil contamination survey because of the history of the gas works. And there was a lot of, and we had to remove the contaminated soil. So it became a very complex operation. Now, there's a curving road or pathway that curled around the site, and that's not used, that's not vehicular access anymore, so it was a pedestrian road. So I thought it'd be nice to create this illusion that it would be balancing on its tip and lean completely across the road. So we designed and built, um, over about nine months, uh, the 40 meter structure, and then we lifted it with two large cranes. And this was the moment I thought, I'm going to get sued, because... <laughs> This is when this is the moment you think I I I should just do watercolors. 
no, that was the moment I thought that. <laughs> And then we used what seemed like the electricity cables to support it, and then we had snapped cables up above. <coughs> and the light on the peninsula is beautiful, and it silhouettes everything. And then we lit it as well, so we create this kind of lattice beacon on the London skyline, as much as possible. It's, it's a little bit far out from London, uh, but it, it does a good job. It, it pulls in people. And this quite nicely shows this idea of developing a sculptural relationship with the surrounding architecture. So that's the gas tower in the background, and that's the pylon in the foreground. And Greenwich is um, intrinsic with time. We have the Greenwich Meridian line. And so the leaning structure creates a projected shadow which moves around the object and it's quite nice, it has a nice reference to a sundial. So we developed all of these different kind of historical and visual and sculptural and kind of contextual dialogues with the work. At the same time, I just include this because what we've started to do now increasingly is create ancillary sculptures. So while we deliver these very large artworks, we're starting to make uh, smaller <laughs> projects. And this was a nice one, I mean, um, I, I only show one image of this, we've got lots more, but it's a beautiful form. We were invited by the same developers to create a piece for their interior atrium. And so I thought what would be fun was to architecturally model the atrium. And it was about seven meters high. And then I said, well, let's, because we're creating the pylon outside, let's find a way of delivering a pylon inside. So we took a smaller pylon, a 23 meter one, and we digitally rolled it into a ball. And so we created this logarithmic spiral that would fit perfectly within the geometry of the space, like one centimeter every way. Um, and it was like a ship in a bottle, you know, it's kind of like, how did you get this in here? And it was a very, this was almost as difficult as the upside down one. Um, so once it was rolled, we had to explode it into all the different parts. And there was about 50 different radiuses going on. And we had to use three different aluminium rollers across the country to roll the aluminium, all different shapes and profiles. And then we had to cut them back at the studio, code them, and then put it together, and then take it apart, then bring it to the space, and then put it together again. And it, it was a challenging process, but it had this idea of illusory fluidity. And I love that. I love defying the material nature of a material, like the sliding house or the melting brick. You know, making brick flexible or making stone weightless, you know, it, 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 in making steel bend. Um, and I'd like to finish with the future. So every single project that we create, of course, brings others. Now, in the studio, we have a board, um, and there's, we have a book of about 50 ideas. So the way we typically work is we have projects that we're delivering, projects that we're, <coughs> sorry, projects that we're delivering, projects that we're developing, and projects that we're dreaming about. The dreaming about PAL is the biggest, unfortunately. Um, but we're constantly finding ways to commission or finance or make them uh, and this is one of those and I just showed this because it's a nice demonstration of how one sculptural exploration leads to a more ambitious idea and is hopefully an outcome that we'll realize soon and that is a kind of neat well hopefully neat a kind of a summary of the work we make and why we make it so um, Hopefully there's questions and hopefully I can answer them. So uh, I'll leave it there and then hopefully address any other issues through conversation. Are there questions for, uh, for Alex? It uh, takes probably a little bit of time to uh, digest what you have, uh, have seen. Uh, but I'm sure you have some questions or some clarifications. There are some people uh, graduate from School of Interior Design, and uh, especially Samir Parker. He has been working with uh, uh, public arts, and his projects are that scale. But he works with the socially deprived people, more of it. 
So his one project was the uh, Bastis of uh, Bombay. And the roof, they were always leaking, so he managed to get some sort of a uh, different uh, tarpatri or whatever we want to call it, just waterproof materials, and gave them color codes, and they all cover with it. So from the sky, you see his fantastic graphics that you would see like Picasso. Then he worked with the rickshawalas because they park at certain place, give them colors, and they really painted rickshaws in different manner. Because in the evening, all rickshaws are parked at one place. So you see the fantastic uh, painting and sculpture mm. as part of the urban uh, scenario. Then he worked with uh, railway stations. And uh, uh, you know the, it's, it's as large as what you were yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. And he involved School of Architecture in Bangalore. And they created structures which would really guide people because we don't have so much signage of walking, getting to the trains, etc. And they created a huge structure. Yeah. So he's been at uh, uh, this kind of public arts lot. Yeah. He had done several installations in Bombay, uh, which are very large scale, uh, as big as the buildings, etc. Yeah. So when you come here to uh, work further, probably it would be nice to involve him. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, with you because he has a lot of ideas and he's still working on that's what he does. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. But he works more with the socially needed people to get people really know about them, you know, get them going. So yeah, th th I mean, that's an idea I want to explore more. I mean, I was talking about this on the way on the car here. Is that like, that's the other area of public sculpture I want to address. It, it's um, trying to think about more, even more about the public. You know, I, I like to think that the work is, 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 it delivers things, positive things in a public place and to public, the public. But I like the idea of, um, uh, I don't, I don't really know what it is, but acting with a kind of more, a more obvious social outcome. So we're developing a project at the moment. Um, and so every project that we create, we, we do give, back to the community in different ways. Um, but increasingly, we want to develop ideas and projects which do more. Uh, I mean, an example is that we're developing a project at the moment where we're looking to invest about 20% of the project budget into commissioning artists from that area. So it's not just about, oh, OK, that's the project budget here's the project, it's, well, okay, let's take that section of the project budget and use it to facilitate 20 projects with, you know, emerging artists. And I, I like that idea. And we're also starting to produce ancillary products, so we, products, but, you know, we're producing limited edition prints or uh, images which we're gifting to local residents as well. So it's this idea of kind of engagement and involvement and facilitation of the arts, which I really like, um, and helping, if possible. Some of the states are quite uh, ahead, like Chattisgarh. They have 10% the of their budget is in public arts. That's incredible. So that's a new developing city. So 10% of budget is in the craft sector. Yeah. And the rest is used in public arts. That's amazing. We have a borough in London called Westminster which is renowned for the arts, their art budget is zero. And um, they built their reputation on it. And when we were, I shouldn't, I'm on camera, This I'm probably going to get in trouble when I get back to the UK. When I get off the plane, I'm going to be in trouble now, but I'll say it, because it's their fault, it's not mine. When we were developing the hovering building, that was in Westminster, and they did everything, they tried to stop it. Now, so they were trying to stop that, and then we delivered it. Eventually, I convinced them to do it took a lot of work and then we did it and the head of the council wrote a letter to the developers to say can we have it for two months longer because it's so popular and then they said okay we learned our lesson we tried to do we're trying to develop another project for a building in Westminster a temporary project is there for two weeks again the council are saying no so they don't learn and it's I mean 10 percent is incredible that's fantastic but, and this is why I like Margate the building where we did the sliding house because the house prices in Margate have gone up so much, and tourism and trade has gone up so much, and it's become famous f not for its seaside destination at present, but because of this new cultural energy. So I, it, it, I just think too many um, 
I can't speak for here, but uh, it sounds great, you know, what you're suggesting, but in the UK, too many councils see art as a, an indulgence and not something of genuine kind of social value. That is, I'm a sculptor. Uh, I have a series of questions. Uh, I'm too uncomfortable with this. I have a number of questions, but I will not go into, but a simple question to me is, what caption you will give to this visual that uh, is a futurist possibility that you said? This is a for future. The visual I see on the screen is for the future. Yeah. What is the kind of a thing that you want to reveal? Reveal or say? Like a message? Not say, revealing. What is it that you open it that people will sense it? By that sure. they didn't know. For example, I will give you a very nice example. Yeah. As a child, I am from a very small village and on very small land that we had, we have a huge tower which occupied quite a bit of land. As a child, I had a question, what must be under the ground to take so much of weight above the ground? I have seen this experience with trees because when flood comes, it remove lots of soil from the ground and we can see the roots. Hmm. So I had a very interesting experience what is above the ground and what is under the ground. But with this tower, it's a beautiful structure. As a child I have seen for age, how many years I have seen. Hmm. Still I did not know what is underneath. I wish you could reveal something of that structurally. In this? Yep. <laughs> it's, you're, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We did draw one with concrete on. So we did draw one with concrete at the top. I think what I've become worried about is um, I worry too much what people think. Um, but I live by the f theory that only the paranoid survive. So, um, But I, 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 I've become nervous about too much narrative in like over theatricalizing my work the work is quite playful and the public know what to do with it they just get on with it enjoy it and enjoy it the design community quite like it because of the complexity of the structures the art world don't really know what to do with it they don't know whether it's, it's it, it, it because it's enjoyable and fun and popular they're suspicious of it and i am slightly suspicious of this idea of over theatricalizing it and when we put the concrete on it it felt to it, 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 it it's a difficult I, I always have this decision I almost every time we develop a project to do two drawings I say that's the popular one that's the one the public will like that's the one the art world would like and I always try and decide which one I should go for I normally well, no, I don't know where I end up normally but um, and I feel like that it, it, you're right it's you've you, that's a decision that we're wrestling with. Yeah. Alex, well, well taken, but I still have uh, something interesting thing to ask you. When you say that this is to enjoy, now suppose if you pass underneath, I don't know whether one would really enjoy looking at such a huge weight above the head. <laughs> it's a bit and like. The experience is fantastic. Yeah, no, I wouldn't go underneath that either. But um, <laughs> it. it I, I know what you mean. I, I think the, the view, would, the looking up, would be beautiful. I mean, unfortunately, this, I'm only showing one render. We've got about five or six of every experience. Um, and it's a nice thing, I think. Um, it's a big thing. It's quite an obtrusive structure. But electricity pylons are, so you kind of get away with it because they're already there, in a way. Um, I think... I think people would like it. There's a childish, you know that, the, the thing where you do a cat's cradle, where you, you have string as a, as a child and you twist it, and it has that kind of simplicity and playfulness. Um, I don't know, it's a bit like going on a roller coaster. You, 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 you don't enjoy it while you're on it, but then when you get off, you're glad you did it in a way. I don't know. <laughs> but also, uh, such a great way, I don't know what is with the way. Of this structure. Yeah, it's heavy. What kind of wire that you will use to hold the weight? It's a steel, it's a spiral steel wire. So 
yeah. Like, is it existing that kind of work? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Yeah, interestingly, it's not about making the... So this is a very complex engineering challenge, and we, we, we're about 25% of the way into it. Um, we need more money to continue it. Uh, but we've teamed up with um, cable specialists and aeroelasticity specialists from Cambridge University. And interestingly, it's not about making the middle pylon lighter, it's about making it heavier and the nose as heavy as possible. So I think at the moment it's about uh, parts of the, the steel will be box section filled with concrete and such. So the nose of it will be extremely heavy. It's, it's, it's far too complicated for me. I just come up with the things. <laughs> Uh, hello, sir. I'm a design student, and uh, recently uh, we have been studying about uh, environmental art and uh, sculptures. So, like, I would like to know if you are interested in um, building art and sculptures related to environment. Like all these works I saw, they are really good work that you are, you are doing. But like, would you be inclined to environment environmental? art and sculptures like more oriented to nature um uh, i want to i, w I want to say yes i mean interestingly the reason i'm here the origins of the invitation were out of this combination of the gnat program which is nature and art um and then i said that's not right for me I'm more interested in art and architecture, and A cubed, this art, architecture, and artisans is, a, is more of a hybrid. I, I want to say yes, and we've explored rural environments before. We've done pieces with thatch before. Um, we made a thatched roof do something quite fun. Uh, I, I, I want to say yes, but I live in London and I live very much in an urban environment and it's urban architecture that really excites me or urban... It, it, I, I, I believe in this idea of osmosis whereby if you live in an environment it feeds you ideas and that's why I like this idea of making when I make contextually responsive artwork I go to the location and spend a lot of time there and then just hope that it feeds me ideas so I guess the short answer is I think if I spent a lot of time in the countryside or in a rural context, yes, I would make art that responded to that. The materials, the scale, whatever felt most exciting and appropriate. Um, but at present, I've, I haven't worked in that way. Um, I think that's partly because, as I say, initially at the moment I'm excited by a more urban influences and sadly at the moment the reality is the only way we can kind of continue to create projects and uh, feed my ambition is through commissions and the reality is that commissions typically come in the city because uh, that's where the people and the, the commissioners are um, but increasingly I'd like to make work which isn't so city focused and isn't necessarily always to the same audience. I love the idea of creating artworks where people don't expect to find them. You know, eventually I love the idea of the studio developing enough, I guess building up enough resources so we can commission ourselves to produce work wherever we want, however we want. And in that respect, I'd definitely like to explore r rural situations. Yeah, absolutely. To surprise the public rather than pleasing. Oh, to surprise rather than pleasing. Uh, it's difficult. There's this. Um, um, there's there's a terrible thing in public art, which is the word stunt. You know, uh, where it's just a cheap stunt, and my work can get quite close to that, and that 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 gives me nightmares. Um, there's, yeah, uh, I, I don't think public art is doing that. I think people are, are, are making media, dressing media stunts as public art, and it's not. Uh, 
I think you can immediately, t when something just purely exists for um, intentions outside of artistic content uh, considerations, you can immediately tell, you can smell a rat, you know, it's overly branded or the quality isn't there or there's, there's so many decisions which just aren't there. Whereas I think public art, um, in terms of this idea of surprise, um, but I think pleasure and surprise can be intertwined experiences, but I think public art um, just manages to stay on the right side of the fence and separates itself from the media circus that is all of these kind of stunts that pop up around cities. It's a very fine line and it's very difficult. But I'm talking about kind of theatrical public art and I'm, mainly, I'm talking about the UK as well really, but there is a real issue I have with public art at the same time that it's so often just an afterthought and it's just a bit on the end of an architectural development. You know, so we have this model in the UK and it's being removed, which is a shame, I suppose, where on big developments, the developers have a responsibility to invest a small percentage into public art. And they say that's fine because that has a functional value and it decorates the space. But the artwork so often is not conceived and developed and designed in parallel with the architectural development. So the two don't have a very good dialogue. And the architectural development is beautifully considered, beautifully designed, it's ambitious, it's innovative, and it's durable. The artwork, because it's made by an artist, is badly designed, <laughs> and it's not durable. And it just gives public art such a bad name. So it looks good for about a month, and then after that it starts to look terrible. And I, that's my real problem with public art in the city. It's so badly commissioned and managed at the moment. And increasingly what my studio is trying to do is when we're invited or approached by developers, the first thing we say is we need to meet the architects. And start to develop a sensitive conversation about how the artwork might have a, a well, needs to have a good dialogue with their building. And better yet, maybe physically interact with their building. But what we're increasingly trying to do is design the buildings now. Um, so, as I say, I'm not an architect, but I'm starting to work with architects in my studio to design functioning spaces. They won't quite have the theatricality and at times novelty of these. They'll be t c calmed down, but they'll still have some of the sculptural language. Um, it's early days, but um, we're, we're developing one building at the moment, which is really exciting. It's probably the beginning of the end for me, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, first in the back. Uh, you talked about uh, temporary public art and how it has sometimes relevant to the community also. Uh, this might be an architectural perspective, but uh, what do you feel is the role of sustainability and environmentally conscious designs in these kind of projects? In, in terms of temporary public art, yeah, I think that has to be um, factored into the design at the outset, yeah. Not partly the design, but also the strategy. So, um, where almost every artist, uh, young artist goes wrong is that they, they budget for the installation and forget about the deinstallation. Um, and then they don't plan the deinstallation. And that includes the removal of the material. And it depends on what the artwork's doing. I mean, sometimes our temporary artworks um, have an afterlife in certain ways, but typically, they don't because they're unique to their location and also at times we've had situations where by contract we're not allowed to show it anywhere else and we have to contractually destroy it. Um, so, but what we do is we save the steel and we just reuse the steel um, and then dep depending on the material we develop the strategy around it. The polystyrene was recycled so the hovering building was taken to a huge company which takes all theatre sets and props and recycles all the materials. The melting house was about, that was about 10 tons of wax or something. That was shoveled up with JCBs into skips and then taken, that was used in fire lighters. Um, you know, you get those waxy things that you chuck on fires. Um, that was used to produce those because it's just real low quality wax objects. So they, they recycled it that way. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, so it's all part of it. I mean, it's important. It is important. We consider it, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, with regard to the pylon, the inverted pylon, that's going to be there for about 10 years until the development takes place, and then it's going to be moved. Um, with regard to the concrete, um, we'll develop that strategy in 10 years' time, what we'll do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was under too much pressure. <laughs> okay, Alex, uh, you are here since the uh, 10th of February and tomorrow you're leaving and we were been traveling and we were talking a lot about the architecture you saw in India. So I would like to request you that uh, would you share something your uh, experience like what is the difference uh, you found in the being in India and because this is the first time you visit India. Mm. So please uh, share your experience with us. Well, um, thinking out loud I suppose and I hope it's honest and not offensive in any way because my experience has been an absolutely positive one. Um, I mean it's very different. It's very different and that's exactly what I hoped it would be. Um, I think there's no progress without risk and there's, a, you know, by placing yourself in different environments inevitably develops new ideas. Um, well, just because this is the first thing that comes to mind and it's not the most important, but one thing that's astounded me is the sculptural possibilities. So when I arrived um, on the first day, so Sumu said to me, it's so much easier to be a sculptor in India than it is in England. Um, and I didn't really know what he meant, but I, people here, I found, certainly the people I've met, have been very welcoming and enthusiastic about the idea of introducing public art into spaces. And the all of the factories and all of the different um, facilities and makers and craftsmen that we went to were all interested and keen to be involved. That's not a response I get in the UK. Typically, if you turn up and you want to learn more about the process, um, they're a little bit suspicious of an artist turning up anyway. But they, not many of the companies want to stray away from what they do, from the everyday and the familiar. And I, I found so far that the artisans and the Indian manufacturers that we've met have embraced this idea of challenge. Um, comparatively, the, the financially, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. I mean, it's just mind-blowing. I, do, I don't really know how to manage it. Uh, I'll give you an example. We, we went to a brickworks. We've been to several, a lot of brickworks. It's a material I love. And I, I love how bricks are made here. Um, the, the fired bricks, the outside fired bricks. So much brick making in the UK is machine and factory based now. So as an example, one of those bricks, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, one of the handmade bricks was four rupees, which translated to about 4p. Now it's about, I think it's about 60 bricks per square meter. So 60 bricks, so a square meter was two translates to £2.40 in the UK. You, you can't buy one handmade brick for £2.40 in the UK. So I was, that, that was astounding. You know, and my part of me just goes crazy. You know, like, just goes, oh my, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. I, I, you know, I nearly bought a ship. Um, like, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, because it, it, that the potential is is amazing, but then there's also a responsibility at my end to not exploit that. So I, I have to go back and work out how I feel about that because I'm not prepared to come back and start just paying two pound forty for sixty bricks because that doesn't feel fair at the same time. But then I like the idea of coming back and working with local artisans and creating and commissioning them to make thousands and thousands of bricks. But that was a, that was one very noticeable difference. Um, and then, of course, the landscape is very different, although you have electricity pylons, so I felt at home in that respect. Um, but the landscape is, is, is extremely different, and the architecture is not at all what I expected. Um, what I have enjoyed the most, and I think in our very, very, very initial and early conversations, I think there's a difference here. I, I mean, and I think this is where maybe a kind of conflict might develop further down the line, and if, if it ever got to this point where, typically in the UK, we work with wealthy developers who commission projects, and they're fantastic. They're typically great people, and they're wonderful people to work with, and they are great 
commissioners of cultural activity in the UK, and they're brilliant. Now, in, the, in India, let's say that same model happened. It's just say if I worked with a developer in India. I get the sense that with Indian developers, and I may have read this completely wrong, there seems to be a slight inclination towards a presentation of wealth at times. And the conflict I foresee is that my, I'm most excited by the materials and the structures and the architectural the forms which aren't necessarily associated with wealth in this country. Um, I am particularly like the more handmade, organic architecture that develops on the roadsides out of survival. And I know that's not something to be spectated on and enjoyed in many ways, but they do create fascinating kind of eclectic architectural assemblages, which in the UK we do not have. So from a you know from a someone coming from the UK who's interested in materials and making, they are fascinating structures to to, to, to kind of experience. So um, I, I try and answer that sensitively, but it's it's just the truth. I mean, so I found that I think I think the ideal scenario is that I would come back and respond to those and create sculptures which are I don't know. I don't want to say the word celebratory of those structures because that sounds patronising. I don't understand the econ the politics or the economics of India well enough to comment on that. But if I was to come back and make sculptures, I'd want to use those materials and that architectural language. Yeah. Um, but I need to understand it more. This trip has been very exciting, though, for me. I mean, um, I've, I'm returning with many more ideas, and I have the intent of coming back and realizing projects here, certainly. And the nice thing is, potentially, potentially, and I don't want to say this, I don't want to kind of dig myself a hole here, but m there is the potential to, because of the... The, because of the, the fact that we can produce more for less money here, uh, there is an exciting potential to self-commission. So, you, you know, we can pay for it ourselves here, uh, which, is, which is kind of exciting. But that doesn't mean we just turn up and just go, right, one there, one there. You know, it still needs to be considered and sensitive. You know, and I don't want to be, you know, like an Englishman in India who just thinks he can just run around doing public art either. I mean... That that would be also terrible. I've got to go back and sort it out. It's just it's so it's such a onslaught of experience. This country. I mean, visually, it's it's a lot, and I need to just go away and digest it, basically. But it's been great. So yeah. yeah. Good evening. I'm Shweta. I'm one of the environmental artist and uh, I have a question regarding what leads you to the practice of working with illusion and upside down artworks like is there an incident or a theory like or an inspiration like how did you decide that you want to deal with illusions with your practice and the other question was how do you relate this illusion with a site like how do you scale your work with the illusion like if you, if you want to uh, refer making uh, large scale work, then how do you relate the illusion, the scale, and the site? Like the scale is in relationship to the surroundings. So that that's just so. Um, typically, the scale is uh, in relationship to the surrounding architecture. Um, with the upside down pylon, had nothing around it. So even though it was very large, it actually didn't feel that big. Size and scale are two very different things, as you know. So um, it, 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 it's um, that's that's that. That's just a very environment, you know, uh, contextually driven um, dimensional decision. But the the illusion. I mean, it kind of came from this idea. Again, it was coming back to this idea, like the idea of delivering simple pleasures. But what illusions are? They're visually enticing, and they're visually mesmerizing, and they have the ability to, through aesthetics, to engage someone and hold their attention. And I think in some ways that's kind of what art, one of the responsibilities art has. So I like the fact it was doing those jobs. Um, I like magic, you know, and um, I liked the idea of making something impossible feel momentarily achievable. That's quite a nice optimistic thought, I suppose. Um, all of those things combined, and I kind of came out of it at that other end. The upside down thing I hate, 
you know, I, I, that that happened with those houses, and um, I don't like that piece anymore. But it, that was just that was just a very simple response to the architectural silhouette that was there. It was one building with a vehicular underpass, so you know, so it had that cutout. And I just thought it was so neat that you could create the you know, two buildings of different heights. And I thought, well, that only works if you turn them upside down. And I thought, well, it's quite nice because then you can make them just like the surrounding buildings, but they're upside down. And it, it was that thought process. And then I thought, well, we'll do it to execute it really well. But it's too, that's just too easy, conceptually. Um, and I returned to it with the pylon. Because I justified that because of the lean and because of the huge structural challenge attached to it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the truthful answer in terms of all of those things. Yeah. Pleasure. I think uh, we wrap it up. Uh, one more round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Alex. Pleasure.